Hi everybody, welcome, welcome, welcome to Vanessa's Van Life Journey. I am here today with another interview from another nomad. And we are located in Quartzsite, Arizona. And one thing that I have found being new to being on the road is that you need to connect with people, talk to people, find somebody that has information concerning where you're at. And Mr. Mark here is a very knowledgeable guy. He helps a lot of people. He's very informative. So we wanted to talk with him today to find out a few things about Corsite, Arizona that might be helpful if you are coming down here. Hi, Mark. Introduce yourself. Hi, my <laughs> name is Mark. Uh, I go by The Wandering Night on Facebook. Uh, this is my third winter at Quartzsite. And uh, while I'm not a big fan of the desert, it's a lot nicer here than it is back in Michigan where I come from. Uh, things to see in Quartzsite, there's a couple of wildlife refuges within sight, more than a day, easy day's travel. Uh, there's a Arizona Peace Trail, which is a side-by-side off-road type trail that you can drive. It goes from Yuma to a little town called Wikiup in the north. Uh, Quartzsite's about 70 miles north of Yuma and about 20 miles east of Blythe, California. And then Parker, Arizona is to the north about 30 miles. And if you want to go to Tucson where the big cities are, it's about 100 miles to the east. Uh, a lot of things you can be found here in Quartzsite. There's a huge RV show and there's a huge rock and uh, gem show which brings in the majority of the people this time of year. Uh, there's a lot of things for people who RV parts, uh, things for repairing solar systems, installing solar, That's pretty much the main attraction of Quartzsite. What are the, uh, do you have the dates to those events that you mentioned? Like what uh, usually? The Big Tent, which is a big uh, RV parts and recruiting. They recruit summer help for nomads who need seasonal work. It's from the 21st until the 29th, I believe, this year. And, and if you come to Quartzsite, you'll see a huge tent. It's a little bit bigger than a football field. It's big. That's in February? That's in January. Yeah, January. January. Yeah. Okay. The mineral show, I believe, is, is going on right now. I think it runs until the 19th. The mineral show. Where is that at? That's uh, in the tents of Quartzsite. Okay. I think it's near Tyson Wells. Uh, tents. There's like little tent. I call them bazaars little tents and vendors set up a tent and sell their wares. So uh, do you have any advice on uh, helping people to find BLM land down here to uh, camp on? Oh, in Quartzsite, as soon as you hit the edge of the city limits, you're on BLM land. Um, there's a large uh, BLM spot north of town called High Jolly. That is the closest uh, camping spot to Quartzsite City. And then a little further north of there is Plamosa Road. And there's camping at both sides of that road. And it goes all the way to a little town called Baus. And there's camping all the way to Baus. And that's about a 20 mile drive because I, I drove it. Yes. So for 20 miles, you have BLM land to the left and to the right. right. Exactly. And then when you go to the west side of Quartzsite, there's a place called Dome Rock, and there's an exit for it, and you can see the, it's a, they call it Dome Rock, but it's actually a mountain, Sugarloaf Mountain, and it's easy to spot because it's all rounded on top, like a dome. And then south of Quartzsite is a Road Runner, which is free BLM camping. And then the BLM also has uh, paid for sites and they're called long-term visitor areas or LTVAs. 
and those are located south of town as well. There's four of them, and for $180, you can spend um, six or seven months without having to move. On the free BLM sites, they want you to move every 14 days, but that's kind of give or take. It depends on the ranger. And then when you go west of Quartzsite, there's a place called Scat, uh, Scadden Wash, yeah. and that's the road into Scadden Wash is rough, but once you get to the to the camping area, it's rather smooth. Mm -hmm. And then a little further west is a place called Gold Nugget. That's the name of the exit, and there's BLM camping in there as well. All free. So uh, if you had to move every 14 days, how? F I mean, do you just move to, say for instance, uh, we're off of, how is it pronounced? Pomosa. Pomosa Road. So if we had to move in 14 days, where else could we go from here? Well, technically they want you to move 30 miles away and stay away for 28 days. So that would put you, you could probably get away with going down to Kofa National Wildlife Refuge off of Palm Canyon Road. There's BLM at the beginning of that road, and then further in, there's a National Wildlife Refuge, and you can camp in there as well. And how long can you camp at those places? Those are 14 days each. So really, you could just move three miles down the road, set up camp again, and stay in the same area. Okay. And, or you can go up to a town called Parker, that's north of Quartzsite, and there's some camping in the Arizona side, the better part, better camping is in the town of Earp, and Earp is really nothing more than a post office. There's really nothing there. Everything is in Parker. And in Earp, when you get on the opposite side of the Indian Reservation, you can camp BLM 14 days up there as well. And that's 30 to 40 miles away, so you're well within the restrictions. Oh, okay. So you could do like a star pattern. So how long have you been living in your vehicle? I left uh, Detroit, Michigan on uh, July 5th, 2020. And I've been on the road ever since. And so are you uh, full-time? Yes. And I, I go home once in a while to visit relatives in Michigan. I'll stay a month or two and then back out on the road. So how are you enjoying it? I like it a lot. Okay. And how long are you going to be doing this? Till I can. <laughs> <laughs> I said the other day, I'm going to be doing it until they take my driver's license. Yeah. <laughs> and then I'll find somebody else to drive me around. I'm going to find a chauffeur. I might find Mark. <laughs> yeah. Mark, you, Mark is a very handy guy. And can you give people out there advice on, like, moving to the nomad life and how to find people because you have a little tribe that sometimes you want to be bothered with and sometimes you don't um enjoy got nuts and mountains don't <laughs> yeah. uh how do you deal with that and how did you find your tribe and and just give give the people some advice okay well initially uh when howell was doing the rubber tramp rendezvous, rendezvous they would have caravans that traveled together and they would have meetings around the campfire. Well, when COVID started, they broke that up and they did virtual caravans on Zoom. And so I joined one of those and I met a lot of people online. And I met Ann and I met Janelle. So, and we just kept joining one of the caravans, start with Hawa and then ask around the people that you, you see on the Hawa caravans, virtual caravans. Everybody usually asks, you know, where are you at? How are you doing? Okay, and a lot of uh, a lot of people are scared. They have so many fears coming into van life, nomad life. Uh, like, as far as information, like I'm finding, I came to this is my first time in Quartzsite, Arizona, and I met you in Pahrump, but I didn't know that you, where you were down here and just through meeting Miss Ann when she brought me to camp 
here here we go again i found you again so uh but you are a wealth of knowledge and i just want to encourage people when you get on the road don't be scared to go somewhere and think that you're not going to find somebody that will be able to answer some questions or help you or point you in the right direction so can you like speak on that a little bit about going places and not knowing anybody but when you get there right well the first thing you want to do is get real familiar with your cell phone because that's going to be your line of communication uh, while I'm not a big Facebook fan Facebook is a great resource for groups of people there's nomad groups that they tell you this is where we're at if they're having a uh, potluck, that's a great place to meet. Uh, big campfires, like there's one in town called the Lit Cactus, and they have a big bonfire every Friday, and everybody just, it's just a meet and greet kind of thing. Uh, you're going to need to know how to use your navigation. It's very important that you know where you're going and where you are. So get very familiar with it. And then the only other thing you need to be scared of is the weather because it gets windy out here and sometimes it gets real cold but not very often it's mainly the wind in the desert yeah there's there's very few animals out here that are going to kill you that you can't outrun <laughs> <laughs> i mean the tarantulas as big and scary as they are are very slow <laughs> yeah. They're not very fast at all. They can't sneak up on you. <laughs> no. Well, they can't sneak up on you if you're not paying attention. But once you see them, it's easy to move away. Yeah. They're, you know, chipmunks faster than than a, than a spider. So what el What other animals are out here this time of year? Because usually nomads travel the times of year and go into a place yeah. to get away from the heat. You're not necessarily running toward the heat, but it is warmer here than it was in Pahrump, so that's why you yeah. guys left Pahrump. Right. A lot of people chase 70 degrees. They want to stay in the 70 degree zone. Okay. And uh, when we were up in, in Pahrump, there was, there was a tortoise, and uh, somebody had reported rattlesnake and uh, tarantula. And I saw a tarantula in the Pahrump area. Okay. And uh, now, when I was here two years ago, uh, there was a windstorm, and when I unfolded my my lawn chair, there was a scorpion in the in the chair. So I just used my coffee cup to whip him out of there. <laughs> and had you not looked, would that have ended up in your vehicle? It would have ended up stabbing me in the butt. <laughs> I almost sat on him. <laughs> wow! So you have to be careful. Yeah. But that was on a chair that was folded. Yeah, there was a windstorm and I folded it up so it didn't blow away. And in the morning, the scorpion had taken shelter there. So do scorpions have a season or not? I believe they do. This is their off season. But I advise if you're going to move rocks around here, like if you're going to build a fire ring and you start picking up big rocks, you want to kick them over to make sure there's nothing underneath them. Because you don't want to get poked by a scorpion or a spider. Yeah. And they hide out in there for shade. Mm -hmm. so, so that's their uh, hiding place. That's where scorpions yeah. hide up under rocks. So scorpions don't have a hole that they go into? Uh, they probably do, but when they're out and about hunting, they, they'll just take a break underneath the rock. Okay, and the rattlesnakes? Yeah, rattlesnakes, I haven't seen one yet. In three years I've been down here. I've seen other snakes, but not rattles. Um, a lot of times they curl up underneath the car in the shade during the day and then they'll come out in the mornings and sun themselves to get warmed up wow but you just gotta kind of you have to be very attentive to where you're where you're stepping and it's not hard because the rocks around here you may twist an ankle if you're not careful uh -huh. so you always watch where you're walking so what other snakes have you seen i've seen a red racer and i've seen a Snake. Ooh, okay, what are those? They're, well, they're both, uh, I think they both hunt grasshoppers, maybe mice for the bull snake, because that was a big one. Mm -hmm. Those were in New Mexico and Colorado. 
Are they poisonous? No. Okay. But the, the bull snake is very large. He must have been about two inches in diameter and about four feet long. What color is it he? Was, it looked like a rattlesnake. It was brown and tan, but it didn't have a rattle. Okay. And then the red racer is bright red. It looks like a piece of plastic. It's so red. When you see it moving, it's you take a double take before you know what you're looking at. Now you did not speak that much about the rats, and oh, I rats. think that that is something that you need to touch on. <laughs> yeah. Well, while they're not poisonous, they are a nuisance. There's two critter, critters out here. There's pack rats, and there's the kangaroo rats, or kangaroo mice. They're small, and they, they hop around like a kangaroo. They're actually quite comical to watch, but they like to go climb up into warm places at night, which would be your engine compartment and they like to chew on wires so what I do is I raise the hood of my my vehicle and I put out uh, flashing lights like Christmas lights that are solar powered so they recharge during the day and then at night they stroke hopefully that keeps them away so have you had any issues with them I have not had kangaroo mice in my engine I have had a chipmunk go in there during the day, and I heard them, and I chased them out. Um, other campers here, they've had mice. You just lay traps down with peanut butter, and I would suggest using the lethal trap. We used sticky traps, and it was more, it was more gruesome to have to kill the mouse yourself uh -huh. than to let the trap do it. Okay. And then Janelle had a, a rat, a large pack rat, and she had a friend pin it down while they had to use a hammer to it. Not very nice, but he wasn't going to go willingly. Yeah. <laughs> pack rats are kind of odd. They like to they like to pack their desks with uh, bones and shiny objects. So if you're missing an earring in your rig and you don't know why, you may have a pack rat mm -hmm. who took the earring and brought it back to its nest. Wow. So usually if people get a rat, they'll know, they'll hear it? Yeah, they'll hear it. They'll see their, if you have food in bags or, or cardboard, it'll get chewed through. They'll get into the food. Uh, you want to have tin or Tupperware type plastic containers to keep the food in. It makes it that much harder for them to get at. Okay. They make repellent stuff too you can get on Amazon. And they claim that mint peppermint keeps them away mm -hmm. but I haven't heard anybody with luck doing that okay I have another question because you have a smaller vehicle and you're a dude uh, a lot of people think that it's not you can't do the nomad life or van life comfortably in a minivan so and you've been doing this for how long two and a half years and do you like have any complaints about no i wish i could stand up inside but i can't so just get your pants on halfway <laughs> step out and get everything put the way you want it uh, it's very comfortable i i'm still bendable i can I'm flexible i can still bend and stoop if i couldn't do that that's probably when i'd either have to quit doing nomading or get a bigger vehicle that i could stand up in so can you tell me what the benefits, because you have a tent, uh, and can you tell me what the benefits of having a tent, especially when you live inside of a minivan, and how that really gives you, just makes the experience so much better for you? Yeah. When I first started out, I did not have the tent. I was cooking outside, and it was doing great until the wind started kicking up, and it would blow the flame out on the propane. So... I'd have to move to the windward side of the van to try again. And then if it was raining, everything got wet, I had to pack up and I couldn't cook that day. So I bought a tent and that's become my kitchen and my living room and my restroom. And if I take showers, I'll do a shower inside there. And it's, it's nice to have. It's a 10 by 10 by six. Uh, I think a 10 by 10 is a good size for a nomad if they wanted to put a kitchen 
out of their vehicle because I don't like cooking inside my van. It's too small and I don't want it to catch on fire and, or spill something and then I've got a, a mess in my van. And so I prefer to cook outside or in the tent. And it's been a tremendous, it's, it's tripled the size of my living space. I was gonna say, it, it seems like it's a game changer. Yeah, definitely. So anybody that's living in a smaller vehicle that is not able to stand, you recommend investing in a tent? Yeah. Even if you had a bigger van, if you don't want uh, grease batters on your wall, just cook outside and do it in a tent. And about how long it takes you to put the tent up? I can have the tent popped up in about five minutes and then staked to the ground and windproof in about 10 to 15 minutes. And uh, it's been in 60 mile an hour winds. There hasn't been a problem. Mm -hmm. As long as you're staked down, it's not going anywhere. The shape of my tent, is, my tent is a gazelle and it's very octagonal. There's like no corners on it that would catch the wind. Okay. So the wind just flows around it. So that's a good tip for people who are getting ready to purchase a tent. I'll show everybody your tent too before I leave. Um, is there any other gadgets or anything else that you think is necessary for van life to like make people's life easier that they need to get off the bat? Yeah, well as you can see where we're filming, we're in the sun. And I have a shade cloth awning that I've semi-permanently mounted to the side of the van and when I know I'm not going to be moving I'll put it out and you really need to have your own shade because there's not many trees in this and when you want solar charging you want to be in the sun to charge your batteries so you need to have your own shade uh, I started out with a regular tarp and the first windstorm that I had shredded it so shade cloth it's like a heavy screen mm -hmm. the wind doesn't even move it i'm gonna have to take a look at that you didn't tell me about that mark yeah. i had that i think i had it up in pro i'm not sure i i don't recall seeing it yeah it's easy to set up so a shade cloth awning awning yeah and okay. i just i went to walmart and i bought two extendable painter poles for the poles mm -hmm. instead of buying an expensive tent pole buy some paracord and, and, you, and the heavy duty stakes because the other thing too is when you're going to pound stakes into the ground out here you got to have heavy duty steel steel stakes the plastic ones don't do it and the aluminum ones bad and uh, those little dicky steel steel pegs they just bend okay walmart has a heavy duty steel spike and then in the town of quartzite in the tent areas, there's people that sell rebar tent stakes, and those are real good too. Yeah, I'm gonna have to get me some of those. Uh, so Mark, I just wanna thank you for, and we're gonna see Mark again, you guys, because uh, Mark is knowledgeable in the area of Pahrump as well. So whenever we get down to Pahrump, or if uh, it doesn't matter, I just left Pahrump, I could film this anytime but we're gonna get some more information from one thing we did not talk about was the mail oh yeah yeah well there's a couple ways you can do the mail uh, I have a uh, re I've changed my residency from Michigan to South Dakota and I set up a mail forwarder in South Dakota they have permission to open my mail and to scan it and email me copies if I think it's important and also they will forward it to whatever address you tell them to forward it to. So you can either forward it to, as a general mail to any U.S. post office. Actually, you need to call the post office because some of them don't accept general mail. But call and ask if they do. And then in Quartzsite particularly, there's two uh, email or two mail services. Uh, one of them is BMC, I believe, and they charge annually and then you can have your mail sent to them and then at no charge you can just go down and pick up your mail packages envelopes whatever and then there's another one in town called quiet times 
and they will accept packages. You don't need a membership. You pay three dollars. Usually you have up per package, and it's really convenient. They also send packages out. So if you box it up, put a label on it. I think they even have labeling machines so they can do the label. UPS, FedEx, US Mail, they all drop off mail at Quiet Turn. And as far as shopping, like grocery shopping, mm -hmm. if you're in Quartzsite, Arizona, uh, just give us a little bit of information on how to manage the grocery shopping and stuff like that. Yeah. Quartzsite has got three grocery shops that sell, uh, I would guess, I don't want to say it, modern. It's, it's current, up-to-date produce and canned goods. And then there's two places in town that sell, uh, I call it scratch and dent. It's cans that are, that are beat up and uh, they can't sell them at the regular grocery store so they sell them at Ken's Grocery Outlet which is cash only. And then there's the Quartzsite uh, Food Market and they will accept the credit card over $20 purchase. And I find that they have good stuff. They may be dented, but the cans are, are not expired and they're not, they don't look like they're bulging in any way. And it's not just canned food, they have box stuff. I might have microwave popcorn if you have one. Uh, bottled water, Rockstar drinks if you need a little pep. Mm -hmm. And then uh, if you want another more, and those three legitimate grocery stores in Quartzsite are kind of expensive because there's, that's the only game in town. So if you go into Blythe, which is 20 miles into California, they have an Albertsons there and a Walgreens. So you can get a, a big name grocery store. And then if you travel north to Parker, Arizona, they have a Walmart a Safeway and a food city. So how far is uh, Parker? That's 31 miles. Okay, I, what do they have again? They have a Walmart, a Safeway, and a food city. Okay. Big grocery stores, they're not little ones. Like in Quartzsite, you have Roadrunner and Coyote and Big Market, and they're all small. And the, the Big Market is actually a hardware store and a grocery store so it's not even a full grocery store mm -hmm. the other two are full grocery stores so when you go to into parker like how often do you go uh, once a week maybe when i was in herb camping on the california side i would come in once a week i would dump trash at the city park uh, get water at the kiosks that's another thing you need to do if you uh don't want to pay for bottled water, you can pay for filter, osmo, reverse osmosis water, 25 cents a gallon, or five gallons per dollar mm -hmm. at the kiosk. So when you go on BLM land, when you're, you're in Arizona right now, how long are you going to be in the area? Before I'll stay here from, from November to the end of March is when the weather is tolerable. When you get into October, it's really hot. It's in the 90s. And same with April. It gets into the 90s. October is in the 90s? Yeah. Well, that's how it was on Pahrump, too. Wow. It was 95 when we went to Pahrump. That first week, it was hot. Yeah. So you're getting out of here in, in around March. Well, Mark, we thank you so much for sharing what you know with us today. I appreciate you for wanting to uh, give me some information. I, I need some more information. So, y'all, he's going to be back. He's my information man. <laughs> he's going to be back. I twisted his arm, his leg, and his big toe. <laughs> And he'll be back, you guys. So, y'all, thank y'all so much for watching. Don't forget to like, comment, share, and subscribe. If you have any questions for Mark in the comments bar below concerning Quartzsite, Arizona, that's what this video is about, then ask those questions. He 
will be watching and reading the comments and so uh we might have to put together another video based on your questions so if you have any questions for mark let us know in the comments bar below and i will talk to you guys later thanks for watching and thank you for interviewing with me mark thanks vanessa for having me bye